I want to set the record straight because some of the things we're going to hear are going to raise some questions. And we won't get through all of that, but just let me make it clear that I'm totally for military protection, I'm for police protection, I'm for legal protection of all people. God has got justice. Abuse of any form should not be tolerated. Psalm 82 is a devotion reading yesterday morning. So I read Psalm 82 and it talks about how God is a defender of the weak. He's for the vulnerable. He's for the oppressed. And so should we be. In fact, God has ordained a system to protect the weak. In Romans chapter 13, look at this scripture. It says, Everyone must submit to governing authorities. All authority comes from God. Those in positions of authority have been placed there by God. So anyone who rebels against authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and they will be punished. And in verses 4 and 5, we don't go on to explain that the government bears the sword to punish all viewers. I get that. I agree with that. I'm for that. Even that verse, there's so many nuances there that I struggle with. I may not always agree with, with uh, our political leaders. Some governments are in evil, and they're corrupt. <coughs> And there are even times that we should disobey authorities, according to Acts chapter 5, verse 29, when those authorities are contradicting God's authority. But nevertheless, I'm for the protection of all people, especially the vulnerable and the oppressed. We should get our rights for that. I'm for legal protection, political systems that are in place to do just that. I believe all of that is our thing. So with that said, what I'm going to talk about today in this message is about an overall tenor, an overall way of life for, for us to live as individuals. I'm talking about an individual attitude, a way of life that reflects forgiveness and grace. This sermon is about a personal way of life that conflicts with the way of this world. We're quick to gravitate in this world towards rights and retaliation. This is not right. I have everybody to fight for this and retaliate. That comes natural for us. And we neglect because of that very different way of life on the scriptures and model the prayer text on Christ himself. So, with that on the street, Mark chapter 14, verses 43 through 52. Just as he was speaking, Judas 1 and 12 appeared. With them was a crowd armed with swords and clubs, sent from the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders. Now the traitor had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away in a guard. Guard, uh, go at once to Jesus. Judas said, Rabbi. And kiss him. The man sees Jesus and arrested him. Then one of those standing here drew his sword and struck the servant of a high priest, cutting off his ear. My lady rebellion said to Jesus, if you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me, every day I was with you, teaching in the temple courts, and you did not arrest me. But the scripture must be fulfilled. Then everyone deserted him and fled. A young man, and tradition says that this young man is not himself, the author of this book. A young man wearing nothing but linen garment was following Jesus, and when they seized him, he fled naked, leaving his garment behind. Here's what I discovered in this passage. This is for me, and hopefully, it's something for you too. Three things. I see two attacks. So I got two attacks, two responses to those attacks, and then two applications that we can follow. The two attacks. The first one is against the death. It comes from the inside circle. Verse 43 says that it's Judas who is one of the twelve. And that's significant to me. Because there's a person who walked with Jesus. He knows Jesus. He knows the other eleven disciples. He's Part of this team, and he has been for three years. 
He handled their money. He was an insider. So much so that when the disciples were having the last supper with Jesus, and he talks about that there would be one among them who would betray them, these other eleven have a clue. They don't even know that it's Judas. Which says something about we ought to really take note of that. We can be a follower of Jesus, but not really a follower of Jesus. We can be connected to Jesus, we can be an insider, we can be here on Sunday mornings, but not really be a follower of Jesus. So that's that's you, surely. This had to be the flame for Jesus who wanted so much more for his follower. And now he's betrayed by this one who is on the inside. Maybe you've been betrayed in this way. Somebody in the inner circle of your life, a personal friend, and you know by experience this pain. Somebody that you're close to stabs you in the back and it's painful and you don't understand that. It leads you through the world through. The Psalms talk about this. Psalm 41, verse 9, for example, even my close friend, someone I trusted, one who shared my bread has now turned against me. And in Psalm 55, verse 12, if an enemy were insulting me, insulting me, I could endure it. If a, a foe were rising against me, I could hide. But as you, a man like myself, my companion, my close friend, with whom I once enjoyed sweet fellowship at the house of God as we walked about among the worshipers. And in Psalm 55, his words are as smooth as butter. But his heart is warm. His words are as soothing as lotion, but underneath are daggers. This is a picture of Jews. Walking with Jesus, having the appearance of following Jesus, being a close friend of Jesus, and then betraying Jesus. I've been there, I've experienced this to some degree. Some of you have experienced this uh, a lot more than I have over the years ago. I led a church. We were moving, we were growing, we were experiencing life, it was good. We had a team of elders, our, our, our elder team was, was dying away, it was really good, probably the closest person. All that other team, to me, a very personal friend, went out of conference, went with our worship leader uh, to the conference. They had a great week, they came back, they made the announcement that said, we're going to start a uh, church. Our worship leader is gone, my closest friend, the church is gone, our strongest elder is gone, they're going to start another church. Just around the Feels like a trail. What do you do with that? They had a good family in the church. We weren't that large. We were just a church plan. They had a strong family in the church. What do you do with that? There's just a sense of betrayal. I'm like, what are you thinking? I, I had a response. I'll tell you what that response is here in just a few minutes when we get to the response part of the sermon. But it's a betrayal. And some of you have felt that. A spouse that betrays you, a friend that betrays you, a family member that betrays you. It wounds. That's what Jesus is feeling. That's the first attack. Here's the second attack is that not a kiss of death from the inside, but a club of death from the outside. There were chief priests, it says, teachers of the law, elders. Jesus has already been. Uh, arguing and debating and, you know, having all of these issues with these particular leaders, but then there are also Roman soldiers who come and take Jesus away. And we read about that in, in John's version, John chapter 18, verse 12. And all these are coming against him. So you've got this inside attack, you've got now the outside attack, look at Mark 14, if you skip down a little ways in, in verse 55 and 56. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death. But they didn't find him. Many testified falsely against him, but their statements did not agree. And, and then later, just a little bit below that, in verses 64 and 65, after Jesus testifies to his divinity, 
being equal with God. Here's what they said. You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They all condemned him as worthy of death. Then some began to spit at him, and they blindfolded him, and they struck him with their fists, and said, prophesy. And the yard stood him. And he, and he. So now we're in this period, Lord, we've been here for a long time, and now we get to the end of Jesus' life, and there are six trials that Jesus is going through, and now we're at the beginning of that. There are three trials under Jewish authorities, religious trials, and there are three trials under Roman authority. And so we're beginning to experience some of this, these religious trials. There's a trial before Annas, the former high priest, Caiaphas, the current high priest, and the Sanhedrin, and the Rainbow. And they want to get rid of Jesus so much so, they hated him so much so, they were jealous of him, that they even ignored their own laws. There's maybe seven of their own laws in order to get rid of it. And then the trial before the Roman authorities, there was the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate. So it says in John chapter 18. And he goes before Herod, and he's mocked and he's ridiculed there. And he comes back to Pontius Pilate, who orders Jesus to be flogged and to be executed. And all those charges are going to be very different than, than the religious charges. So, he was charged here with inciting people not to buy it, forbidding people to pay their taxes and claim to be their king. In the end, in my study, it says that the trials of Jesus represent the ultimate mockery of justice. Jesus, the most innocent man in the history of the world, was found guilty, according to them, of crimes and sent to death by crucifixion. You got the inside attack, you got the outside attack, and we can relate to both. There are times where things happen to you and come from the outside that you feel like so deserving and you don't get it, you don't understand it, and it's an attack against your life. I can remember this in uh, years ago, I shared this before, but uh, one night, late at night, we're laying in bed. Um, asleep or close to sleep and, and all of a sudden it, it sounds like gunshots against the side of our home right next to our bedroom window. And I pop out of bed and no idea what's going on only to discover that eggs are being launched in, at, at our house. There was a situation that came up that we brought to light. The people that were affected by that did not like it. And late at night that uh, a bunch of these young men found their way to our home and just started on chance. There were some threats that came as well. Uh, with that, we thought we knew exactly what that was, but there was just a sense of a laugh of this is wrong. It's an attack. We don't deserve this. And I wanted very much to, to get that settled and get it right. And so I remember I think it happened twice and, and said, so I was like, for 10 minutes, I've got my video camera. I'm going to push it right there by the window where they can't see it. I'm going to capture them in the act. And we're going to deal with this. We're going to get it right. I'll tell you what our ultimate response was here in a second as we did the response part of the sermon. So let's just jump into the responses. There were two attacks it's the kiss of death and the club of death from the inside and outside. Here are the two responses. You got a teacher, first of all, who I believe is response in the way of the world. He draws the sword. We read. He was ready to fight. He wants to make things right. This is Peter. You can read from the other accounts of John, Luke, and Matthew. This is Peter who draws the sword. He's ready to make it right. He wants to defend. This person he's been following him for three years. It's been said that, that Peter, as he draws the sword and cuts off the ear of the high priest servant, his name is Malchus, we read that in John chapter 18, that he was either really good or he was really bad with the sword. He was really good if he didn't go with the ear. I mean, that's amazing. He was really bad. 
is going to go to the head and we got to here. But either way, he's retaliating. He's angry. He wants to make it right. This is the way of the world. And this looks not just uh, Peter's mindset, this is the way the disciples function as well. There's a story in chapter 9 that James and John, two of Jesus' disciples, there were King, John, and Peter, there was a part of the three that were kind of the inner circle of the well, closest to Jesus. They're making their way to, as a group of disciples, they're making their way to Jerusalem. They had to go through Samaritan village. The Samaritans say, we don't want anything to do with Jesus in this group. And so they reject them in the village. So James and John had this comment in Luke chapter 9, verse 34. When the disciples, James and John, saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven and destroy them? But Jesus turned and rebuked them. It's interesting, the context of that is why I mean, just before they saw Jesus, it's called the Mount of Transfiguration. They saw Jesus radiating the glory of God, but they also saw Moses and Elijah. And in their mind, they're thinking, hey, Elijah called down fire from heaven and consumed the prophets of Baal. That's what we'll do. That's God's way. You want us to call down fire from heaven. And Jesus turned to the Contrast that response with the second response. Jesus in the way of God. Instead of fighting his enemy, what does Jesus do? Luke chapter 22, verse 51 says that Jesus actually heals his enemy. He restores the man. Peter hacks off his ear. Jesus restores the man that is in hope. Instead of Jesus retaliating, he's silent. It's predicted that Jesus would be this way. In Isaiah 53, verse 7, he was oppressed. He was afflicted. Yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. Really? The way of the world? In the way that God. Other gospel accounts of this particular text say it this way in Matthew chapter 26. Look at this. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back in its place. Jesus said to him, For all who draw the sword will die of the sword. And then later, Jesus said to, uh, to Pilate, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now, my kingdom is from another place. So here's the big, awful question. Is this just for Jesus? Or is this for you? Is this kind of response just for Jesus because he's the Savior? And he had a mission? And his mission was to go to the cross to be the Savior of all mankind? So of course, he's going to say, you put your sword away, but then the rest of the life is, let's do it the other way. Or is this is really for us as well? And I think the answer is obvious when we look at the big context of Scripture. Because this is Jesus' message all along. This is why we want to come to serve him, because I don't like this. It doesn't come natural to me. But Jesus has already said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 38, you've heard that it was said, and I for my head, two for two. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone will slash you on the right cheek, turn the end to the house. Wow. And in Matthew chapter 5, blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad for your rewards are in heaven. And don't retaliate. Don't try to get even. Rejoice and be glad. So let me just give you my responses here from the two examples that I already gave, the church plan experience. It's frustrating. 
I was hurt. I felt wounded. I felt betrayed. I call my mentor. Because now I, I believe it's in France. I can't remember exactly, but I called him and I said, This is what has happened. And I explained the situation. And you know what his response was? He said, What an awesome opportunity. There's a young church that you plant another church in your community. And I wanted to say, wait a second, let me let me explain this again what happened. This is my closest friend. This is a personal family. This is my worship leader. This is another family of the church. There's no one to start another church around the corner. Pray for them somewhere. Call them up for your church. And say, look what God is doing. We could plant and launch another church. And that's what we did. Or how about you heard guys that launched eggs at our home. I'm ready to get even. Anger is a scripture. Like the next day, Romans chapter 12. Look at these scriptures. Romans chapter 12, verse 17. Repay the only for evil, evil for evil. Give thought to what is honorable inside of all. Possible, as far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Never be yourselves. Leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will be burning coals on his head, and I will become evil. And I will be overcome by evil, but overcome evil. With good. And Amy took that literally with your enemy is hungry. These individuals had something going on directly across the street. We knew we thought we knew who they were, and so Amy takes a plate of cookies to the group that meets across the street in the afternoons and says, We just want flesh. This is all right for us. And we see. No vengeance, no evil for evil. Did your man go his way? Let's not. And everything inside us, no more eggs, it's amazing. How generous we turn away from that. I think Peter got this in the end. You know, Peter wrote a book. And uh, look at what he said in 1 Peter. Over and over again, he had to get this because he says, for example, in chapter 2, it's, it's commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they are conscious of God. If you suffer for doing good and you endure it, it's commendable before God. He goes on to say, do not repay evil or insult with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, we repay evil with blessing. This is Peter who draws a sword. Completely different, totally changes. Rejoice, he says, as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. He goes on to say, Your insult is given to the name of Christ, you bless, for the spirit of glory of God rests on you. This is the way I like it. It's not just for Jesus, this is for Peter, it's for the early church. And the other church, and he knows as you read the book of Acts, not one time did they retaliate, not one time did they draw a sword against their persecutors. Notice what happens instead in Acts chapter 5. When they call in the apostles, they beat them. They charge them not to speak in the name of Jesus, and then they let them go. And what did they do? They left the presence of the council, they went back, they got their swords, and they went back. No, they rejoiced. They were kind of worthy to suffer this honor for me. Two responses to applications. Let's go to this. Understand that the, 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 the application, this is the first one. As I think we have to understand the greater context here and receive what has been given to us. Jesus' suffering came not by the sword of Rome. But it, uh, and it wasn't against his own will. 
Matthew says that in this version, in this story, that Jesus could call 12,000 angels to be saved from the cross from Rome. So let's not think about that, that this suffering came by the sword of Rome. It was his choice. His death came willingly by the sword of God. It was God's wrath that put Jesus on the cross. So what does this mean? That Jesus came under the sword of God. Just real quickly, let's go back to Genesis chapter 3. The very beginning of the story of creation, what Adam and Eve sinned. Remember what happened? They were exiled from the garden. They could not return to the garden. And here's the reason why. Genesis chapter 3. Look at this. So the Lord God banished Adam from the garden of Eden to work the ground for which he had been taken. And after he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the garden of Eden cherubim and what? A flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way of the tree, tree of life. No interest. This sword flashes back and forth. There was no way back in. And the cross is Jesus going underneath the sword of God's wrath that we deserve the sinners, but that Jesus took for us so that we can return back into the garden and have infinite fellowship with God that we were missing. 300 years ago, here's how Jonathan Edwards put it. Look at this, it should be on the screen. Christ undertook God's wrath to lead us to the tree of life. And he went before us. Christ himself was slain by that flaming sword. And the sword, having slain the Son of God, appearing in our name, there was a person of infinite worthiness. That sword did full execution in that. And when it had been shed, and when it had shed the blood of Christ, it had done all his work. And Christ, arising from the dead, being a divine person himself, went before us. And now the sword is removed, having done its execution, already having nothing more to do there, having slain Christ. There is no sword now, and the way is open and clear to eternal life for those that are in Christ. So, so first, application is that Jesus endured his attackers so that he could make pain for our sin and get us back in the garden of fellowship with them. That's the first application. Receive it, accept it. It's a gift. We get back in the garden. This is a beautiful thing. Here's the last application. Understand the smaller context, which is hugely important still by dying to self and loving your enemy. In Luke chapter 9, Jesus predicted this is exactly what was going to happen. Look at this. It says, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders. Well, here they are. We just saw this. The chief priests and the teachers of the law. And he must be killed on the, and then on the third day he raised alive. And then, and then, that's not the end of the story. He said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must do the same thing. You must do. Deny yourself. Take up your cross daily and follow me. Whoever wants to save their life, living by the sword, will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. So what does that mean practically? Well, it means that we do for others, especially, especially our enemies, in response to what Jesus did for us when we were enemies of God. What did he do? He loved us. And so he told us in Matthew chapter 5, it says, Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good, and it's in the rain on the just and the unjust. Because that is God's nature. He loves all people. And how do you get the gumption to love in this way? What's the motivation for this? Well, in Luke chapter 7, it says that he goes to forgive the world, loves them. But he was to forgive much, loves much. And when we recognize that we were enemies of God, Romans chapter 5 and 8, we deserve the right of God. Why we were still sinners. 
Christ died for us. And we can say, while they are enemies, while they are sinners, just as we are, we do the same that Jesus did. And we love him in the way that Jesus loved us because he's loved us. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this truth. That you love us and you still love us. We've been reconciled as children of God and we trust what you did for us on the cross and through your resurrection. But the truth is, is that we still battle you. We still fight you. And how do we know we fight you? Because we fight your creation. We fight people that you have made and people that you love. So Lord, I pray that you would change our hearts, that we would embrace the fullness of your love, not just to enjoy, but so that we can love others the same way that you love us. Help us to see how much we have been loved. Help us to see how much we are loved so that we can love in the same way. In Jesus' name. Amen.